When we think about learning, we often picture students in a classroom or lecture hall, books open on their desk, listening intently to a teacher or professor in the front of the room. But in psychology, learning means something else. To psychologists, learning is a long-term change in behavior that's based on experience. Two of the main types of learning are called classical conditioning and operant or instrumental conditioning. Let's talk about classical conditioning first. In the 1890s, a Russian physiologist named Ivan Pavlov did some really famous experiments on dogs. He showed dogs some food and rang a bell at the same time. After a while, the dogs would associate the bell with the food. They would learn that when they heard the bell, they would get fed. Eventually, just ringing the bell made the dog salivate. They learned to expect food at the sound of a bell. You see, under normal conditions, the sight and smell of food causes a dog to salivate. We call the food an unconditioned stimulus, and we call salivation an unconditioned response. Nobody trains a dog to salivate over some steak. However, when we pair an unconditioned stimulus like food with something that was previously neutral, like the sound of a bell, that neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. And so classical conditioning was discovered. We see how this works with animals, but how does it work with humans? In exactly the same way. Let's say that one day you go to the doctor to get a shot. She says, don't worry, this won't hurt a bit, and then gives you the most painful shot you've ever had. A few weeks later, you go to the dentist for a checkup. He starts to put a mirror in your mouth to examine your teeth, and he says, don't worry, this won't hurt a bit. Even though you know the mirror won't hurt, you jump out of the chair and run screaming from the room. When you went to get a shot, the words, this won't hurt a bit, became a conditioned stimulus when they were paired with the pain of the shot, the unconditioned stimulus, which was followed by your conditioned response of getting the heck out of there. Classical conditioning in action. Operant conditioning explains how consequences lead to changes in voluntary behavior. So how does operant conditioning work? There are two main components in operant conditioning, reinforcement and punishment. Reinforcers make it more likely that you'll do something again, while punishers make it less likely. Reinforcement and punishment can be positive or negative, but this doesn't mean good and bad. Positive means the addition of a stimulus, like getting dessert after you finish your veggies, and negative means the removal of a stimulus, like getting a night of no homework because you did well on an exam. Let's look at an example of operant conditioning. After eating dinner with your family, you clear the table and wash the dishes. When you're done, your mom gives you a big hug and says, thank you for helping me. In this situation, your mom's response is positive reinforcement if it makes you more likely to repeat the operant response, which is to clear the table and wash the dishes. Operant conditioning is everywhere in our daily lives. There aren't many things we do that haven't been influenced at some point by operant conditioning. The two uh, pigeons are at either end of a small ping pong table. One pigeon uh, pecks the ball as it comes toward him and knocks it toward the other pigeon. Other pigeon pecks the ball back across the table. If it goes past one pigeon, the other pigeon can eat, and if it goes the other way, the other pigeon eats. So that there is a real, it's a real game. The uh, pigeon uh, is reinforced for a cross-court shot if that is what gets the ball past his opponent. One group of scientists showed the power of operant conditioning by teaching pigeons to be art connoisseurs. Using food as a positive reinforcer, scientists have taught pigeons to select paintings by Monet over those by Picasso. When showed works of other artists, scientists observed stimulus generalization as the pigeons chose the Impressionists over the Cubists. Maybe next they'll condition the pigeons to paint their own masterpieces. A group of scientists placed five monkeys in a cage and in the middle a ladder with bananas on top. Every time a monkey went up the ladder, the scientists soaked the rest of the monkeys with cold water. After a while, every time a monkey went up the ladder, the others beat up the one on the ladder. After some time, no monkey dare go up the ladder, regardless of the temptation. Scientists then decided to substitute one of the monkeys. The first thing this new monkey did was go up the ladder, Immediately, the other monkeys beat him up. After several beatings, the new member learned not to climb the ladder, even though he never knew why. 
A second monkey was substituted, and the same occurred. The first monkey participated on the beating for the second monkey. The replacements repeated until what was left was a group of five monkeys that, even though never received a cold shower, continued to beat up any monkey who attempted to climb the ladder. If you asked the new group of monkeys why the beatings took place, the answer would probably be, Well, I don't know. That's just how things are done around here. The sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running. But when researchers paired the orange cherry almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock, lab rats quickly learned to fear it. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rat's pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone and had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dad's or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rats' bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells, the rats' sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory.